Hello steam festers. In this video I want to talk about how to measure the thrust of a model rocket using only items that are typically found at home. This is a fun science project to do that uh, doesn't require expensive or sophisticated equipment. This is a great time to be learning about rockets because we're living through a golden age of rocket science currently. There's a burgeoning commercial rocket market. Perhaps you heard last May, May 30th, when a SpaceX rocket carried astronauts to the International Space Station. This was the first commercial flight bringing humans into space. And now there are dozens of companies in the business of making and flying rockets. This year is also a very exciting time for space exploration uh, beyond Earth's orbit as there are no less than three spacecraft headed to Mars. There are three missions, uh, one from China, one from the United Arab Emirates, and one from the United States. Uh, the United States mission will land a rover on Mars, and the rover will release a helicopter, a drone. This will be the first helicopter to fly on another planet. First, let's talk briefly about how a rocket works. Here's a rocket. In the tail of the rocket is a motor, which in simplest terms is a container with an opening at the bottom called a nozzle. The container is filled with a flammable material known as a propellant. When the propellant burns, the combustion produces hot gas that escapes through the nozzle. The thrust that lifts the rocket is a result of a law of physics known as the conservation of momentum. The momentum before the propellant burns and after the propellant burns has to be the same. It's conserved. Before the propellant burns, the rocket's not moving, so there's no momentum. The momentum is zero. When the propellant burns, the particles of gas escaping out the nozzle carry momentum in the downward direction. Fast light gas particles have momentum downwards. There must be an equal amount of momentum upwards so that the total momentum will be zero. That upward momentum is carried by the rocket. The heavy, slow rocket has an equal amount of momentum in an opposite direction to that of the fast, light gas particles. Changing momentum and time is the same thing as force. And in this case, the force is known as the thrust. The thrust is the force that lifts the rocket. Next, let's look at the parts of a model rocket motor a little more closely. In this picture, the motor has more structure than in the previous one. There are more parts to it than just a propellant. So let's look a little closer. First, the outer container, known as the case. At the bottom of the case, there's a clay nozzle, uh, which is a constrained opening that will allow the gas produced by combustion of the propellant to leave at high velocity. The orange section is the propellant. There are different kinds of propellants used in rockets. In model rockets, the propellant is always black powder, a solid substance. In larger rockets, uh, the rockets that fly into space, often a liquid propellant is used. In fact, the name rocket motor indicates the propellant is a solid. Traditionally, solid propellant devices are known as motors, and liquid propellant devices are known as engines. Above the propellant, there's a delay charge that controls the timing between the point when the motor no longer provides thrust and the point when the motor will blast the parachute. The delay charge may also produce tracking smoke. Above the delay charge is the ejection charge, which is designed 
uh, to release the parachute, to deploy the parachute. And above the ejection charge is the end cap. So these are the basic parts of a model rocket motor. When we look at how the thrust of the motor changes in time, uh, we'll be able to see some of these different stages. Here are the materials that you'll need for this project. First, of course, you need a rocket motor. In this case, we're going to be using an A83 rocket motor. To ignite the motor, you need one of these electric matches, igniters, and you'll need one of the little plastic plugs to plug it in. Since I'm assuming you've already flown a few rockets, uh, you know what I'm talking about there. And then, of course, you'll need your starter. And this one's kind of a vintage model, a nice long wire so you can stand off at a safe distance. Now, we're going to be measuring the force that the rocket motor produces. So, we need a force meter. This is a handy postal scale. I think I picked this up several years ago for uh, selling items on eBay to estimate postage. What's nice about this scale is the display is on the front. So if you're measuring the force in this vertical direction, you can see from the side and you can be out of the way of what's ever going on vertically here. And the way this scale works, you put something on it and turn it on and it zeroes automatically, so that's going to be handy. Next, we need our test stand. NASA has some very impressive, gigantic towers that they use for test stands. For our test stands, I just got an old, an old metal can here, a can of beans. And then you need your test fixture. So what? We use for this is the tail end of a rocket. So I've got the clamp to hold the motor in. I've got the tail fins. I don't need the body tube or the nose cone. Don't need the parachute. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to put, put the motor in to our test fitting, to our test fixture. We'll put in the electric match in the plug. We'll mount the motor in our test stand. We can zero the scale out. Then as the motor fires, it will generate thrust downwards and that will register on the scale. But it's going to happen quickly, faster than you can catch by eye. So we'll just record the whole process with a simple cell phone and then we can look at the video in slow motion and we can pick out what the force was at any given moment and the frames of the video can individually be analyzed uh, to get an idea of how the force changes in time. Now I take the video from the test stand and I load it into a video editing program. This one's called PowerDirector 365. There's lots of great products to choose from on the market. This program allows me to play the video in slow motion so that I can read the scale at any given point during the video and I I can see the force here and I can see of what time that particular value is occurring. 
and I can step through the video forward or backwards one frame at a time then I can take that data and plot it to get a visual display of how the force changes over the course of the burn. Now I've taken the thrust that I read off the scale from each frame of the video and I've plotted it as a point on this graph. So each circle represents the scale reading from one frame of the video. Now there are several interesting things that we can see in this picture. The time begins at time zero when the electric match is ignited. And in the video this is when you first see flames appear from the motor. About a half a second later you start to see some measurable thrust develop. So the first non-zero readings on the scale appear. And they quickly jump from zero up to the maximum thrust which in this case was 0 0.95 pounds read on the scale. Now that's a little bit lower than what the manufacturer specifies for this motor. And in fact, it's about half of what the manufacturer specifies. But there's a lot of variation uh, from motor to motor. And maybe this one's been sitting in the garage a little too long. They, they do degrade over time eventually. Now approximately half a second later, we see the thrust start to fall. And that matches well with the manufacturer's specification for the burn time of about a half a second. So you see the thrust uh, falls a little more gradually than it rose. And from this point on, we still see flames in the video, but what we're observing is the burning of the delay charge. And this burning does not produce thrust as the propellant does. Next we see the appearance of the tracking smoke and finally the dramatic uh, ejection charge burns and we see the the motor jump a little bit. The total time there for the delay in this case was about 2.7 seconds and that matches well with the manufacturer's specification of a three second delay for this type of motor. Now there's another interesting thing that we can see in this picture if you look very closely at the last several data points. You can see that we got a scale reading that's actually below zero pounds. It's uh, negative. And that represents the mass lost as the gas leaves the, the motor. So that's the mass of the exhausted gas that the scale is measuring at that point. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this demonstration of how to measure the thrust of a rocket motor. And I want to encourage you not just to do the exact same things that I did, but think of ways to improve this measurement. Maybe you've got a better scale on hand. Maybe you can think of a better way to mount the motor, a better way to level it. Give it some thought and have some fun with it. Time traveler we who never die. Time traveler we who never die. Baby, time traveler we who never die. Time traveler we who never die.